Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us for today's uh, Virtual Science Cafe. Uh, today is the final Virtual Science Cafe of the season. It's uh, Modern Tools for Modern Problems, uh, Applying Omics to Coral Reef Conservation. Joining us is Dr. Debashish Bhattacharya from the Department of uh, Microbiology and, Bi um, I'm sorry, Biochemistry and Microbiology. Um, the event is being recorded, just so you, uh, just so you know. Uh, my name is Brian McGonigal. I'm the manager of alumni community engagement for SEBS and the New Jersey Agricultural Experiment Station. Um, excuse me. Uh, right now, I'd like to send it over to Mary, Dr. Mary Nucci, uh, director of the Science Cafe program and professor of human ecology. Mary, take it away. Thank you very much, Brian, and thank you all for joining us today for, as Brian said, the last Science Cafe of this 2020-21 school year. I'm very excited that we have joining us Dr. Bhattacharya from Biochem and Microbiology. And as Brian said, he's going to talk about modern omics or modern tools for modern problems, applying omics for coral reef preservation. So Debashish, it's all yours. Thank you. Okay, hey, thanks, Brian and Mary. Um, it's not a very coral reef-like morning in New Jersey, but uh, hey, let's try to warm up with a little bit of coral reef science. So I'm gonna talk about work in our lab and with our collaborators, both at Rutgers um, and in Hawaii and Australia and other places, and try to develop uh, sort of modern tools for the modern problem of uh, coral reef loss. And I'm gonna focus on these tools called omics, which I'll get into in a few minutes. So what is the modern problem? Well, it's that some of the world's richest uh, species rich ecosystems, probably the world's most rich ecosystem, uh, along with tropical rainforests are coral reefs that house about a quarter of all marine life. Uh, they're amazing. They house not only great diversity, they support a lot of the world's uh, small scale fisheries and they're beautiful and they're sort of, you know, some of the most amazing uh, living ecosystems we have. The problem they're undergoing is being driven by climate change, which is leading to most uh, importantly, the warming of ocean waters that leads to a process known as coral bleaching. So bleaching uh, means that the coral is turning from its beautiful brown color you see on the bottom left of the screen. This brown color comes from dinoflagellate algae that actually give the coral their color as well as provide most of their energy. So as the waters warm up over days and weeks, the photosynthetic algae becomes stressed out. They make um, some nasty chemicals because their machinery for photosynthesis starts to malfunction. This makes the coral very irritated and the coral animal then expels these algae, thereby loses its color. And that, if it goes on long enough, can lead to the death of the reef and the uh, individual colonies in that reef. So, this is a very complicated problem. As everyone knows, climate change is a massively complicated problem, which uh, there's no clear solution in sight yet. Um, but we can learn a lot about corals while this catastrophe unfolds. And we can do a lot with corals in the lab now. For example, we can induce bleaching. This is a healthy rice coral, Montipra, shown on the, in the brown here. Uh, in the top left, you can see after about two weeks of about three degrees Celsius warming of the water, it's bleached. The coral animal is still alive, but it's gotten rid of the dinoflagellate algae that give it the color. So corals are essentially really cool jellyfish that live in massive reefs. What makes corals special is their algal symbionts, as I've just mentioned. They provide over 90% of the energy they need to survive. In fact, they allow them to live in these high light, nutrient poor coastal regions that they transform the photosynthetic cells, allow the, um, the corals to thrive there. And the corals have learned how to biomineralize, that is to make these amazing calcium carbonate or aragonite skeletons that can cover many, many hundreds of square miles. They're also very long lived and, and they're stable ecosystems. So for a relatively simple looking jellyfish with simple tissues, corals have really remarkable impacts on the marine environment. So some of these simidineaceae, these algae are shown in this image, of these uh, round brown cells that are the drivers of coral health. So you have warming waters, the, the algae gets stressed out, the symbiosis between the animal and the algae breaks down, 
the coral bleaches by uh, expelling the symbionts. And then there's risk of disease and eventual death as the health of the coral diminishes. So we wanna study the coral. We have to recognize that just like us, it's a holobiont. So we have our animal body and our, and all tissues, but we're actually covered. And inside of us are many millions and billions of bacteria with hundreds of millions of genes interacting with our body and our skin and our gut and all the cavities, as you all well know. In the same way, although the coral is a much, much simpler organism, it's living in a far more complex environment where there's millions and billions of viruses and bacteria around it. And many of those are inside the tissues of the coral. So we refer to this as the coral holobiont. That is a combination of the coral animal, the dinoflagellates I've mentioned, and all the microbes, fungi, anything else that's living on or inside the tissues. So coral bleaching is a interesting scientific phenomenon that we and a lot of other people around the world are studying to understand the mechanisms, how it happens, how we can prevent it and, and diagnose it. But coral bleaching is obviously a much, much bigger problem uh, for the world because it's happening on a massive scale. Uh, here, for example, this is a huge field of coral that are, it have been bleached due to uh, thermal stress. If you look at the Great Barrier Reef, all those regions shown in dark red there are areas of coral mortality uh, due to this thermal stress and the, and the less red colors show less severe extent of bleaching. So the GBR is about the size of Germany and about 50% of its reef has been reduced due to extended warming periods that have um, created this massive coral bleaching problem. Some folks think it's gonna change significantly in the next 10 to 20 years. It will be reshaped by environmental change. But we should remember that corals have survived five mass extinction events over their over the over 200 million year evolutionary history. So it's not, we believe that corals are going to go extinct, but the current distribution and the current species richness in particular areas are gonna suffer greatly because of climate change. So about 25% of the small scale fisheries are on reefs with about 50% of them in Southeast Asia. So we're talking about a lot of subsist subsistence communities that are gonna suffer. And as the sea levels rise and the corals die off, there's gonna be more uh, exposure uh, to wave surge and so on. So we're talking about very serious problems. If not directly in New Jersey, we're talking about many parts of the world that are highly populated and low-lying that will suffer. So I was a member of a uh, working group led by Steve Palumbi at Stanford, where we got together over a year and a half and put together a report that summarizes some of these, some of the most amazing things about coral reefs, their symbiosis, but also some of the really disastrous consequences of human-induced climate change. So as you could probably imagine, there was a call for rapid action. The thing with the loss of reefs is it's not just due to climate change. There are a lot of local stressors that are reducing reefs all over the world, mostly due to overfishing that are taking away some of the predators of the algae that live can overgrow the reefs pumping sewage, overdevelopment where silt and other sort of um, soil materials come into the reefs and suffocate them and over ecotourism in which people literally trample reefs or uh, damage them otherwise. So saving reefs on a broad scale will require individual nations and individual areas to take care of reefs as well as this much more challenging climate change issue we haven't had. Okay, so I can tell you that I was born on a reef, <laughs> but that wouldn't be true. I grew up in Nova Scotia, which if you know anything about Canadian geography, it's a little piece of land that sticks out on the, in the North Atlantic, it's freezing cold. I learned my diving in dry suits, freezing in waters and uh, beautiful, but no corals. So during my early career, I was very, very interested by marine life. And I got interested in a field called symbiosis research, where we think about how interacting organisms, how they work, what do they share, what constraints drive their biology. So given that, I was able to make a reasonable jump to the world of corals. And um, I'm gonna use a, 
Maybe a silly analogy, but I'll let you know how a symbiosis uh, scientist may think about it. So there's a famous scene in the movie uh, Up in the Air where George Clooney uses this rather absurd and somewhat naive view of the world where he says, what's in your backpack is what you need to survive in the world. You can shed all of the extra stuff, your friendships and your possessions and be real, a real solo dude. Well, that's not a very appealing idea, but there is a interesting biological sort of take home from that. We call this a symbiont genetic load. So let's say your backpack is all those bacteria you have that keep you alive. Okay, so using that analogy, we have a lot of organisms that have nearly empty backpacks. They're symbionts and the DNAs they contain have been trimmed down small, smaller and smaller through a process called genome reduction. And so they essentially use their backpack with just a few bacteria that have very restricted functions for example, providing some amino acids we don't get otherwise in our diet. So that's a much, much more tractable and straightforward problem to look at, okay? You've got an organism and it's got really tiny little bacterial genomes providing very limited goods. The other side is a lot more complicated. <laughs> that's the full backpack side. Humans, as I said, have many hundreds of millions of bacterial genes floating around in their bodies and many trillions of cells. The corals are similar. They live in a complex environment, so they have a very complicated lifestyle with many microbes, and this has been going on for over 200 million years. So we have to think about the coral like you think about a full backpack. There's a lot of stuff going on that we have to then understand. So you can, there's a couple of ways you can do that. The first is the reductionist approach. You pull out the algae, you isolate, you know, you isolate, you grow them up, you see how they behave under different maybe temperature and okay, say, okay, let's choose the algae that are the most robust under climate change, let's put them back in the coral. So many people are doing this, taking apart this backpack of microbes and other things and trying to figure out how it works. What I'm gonna talk about today is more the other way, the embrace the complexity. Let's just look at the entire holobiont and see what we can learn by um, characterizing the sort of the wholeness of the biology there. So this, you know, uh, idea led to what, what I set up as the Coral Hospital that is ultimately to borrow techniques from some of the most modern approaches that are being um, developed for health research to study the whole coral organism and see if we can use that to advance conservation. That's what I wanna focus on from now on is we're gonna to try to take the coral as a unit and see whether we can learn something about how it behaves under thermal stress and see if that can help us diagnose and potentially help, um, help uh, push forward conservation. So if you're interested in this approach, we made a short YouTube video called How to Build a Coral Hospital and it's available you can see it at this website or in our coral-based website uh, in our lab. And essentially, we use different uh, methods in the so-called omics toolkit. So omics is the last piece of the word in genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics. These are all the information and the products that come from, from genes that define a phenotype. That is what an organism does, how it looks, how it, how it responds to stress. So just like in the world of health, we can generate omics data from different coral species under different conditions, try to figure out of the omics data, which are the most informative about particular uh, illnesses or particular phenotypes that we're interested in. See if we can come up with a strategy based on that knowledge and ultimately try to apply it in the field, initially on a small scale and maybe someday on a larger scale. So medical research has gone on for a long time. So uh, it takes a village to get this sort of a project off the ground. And we're not the only people doing this. There are many people around the world trying to build sort of an omics based knowledge sort of of corals that can help in a lot of different ways beyond understanding basic biology, also then understanding how corals, uh, how we can help preserve coral reefs. So this is a, a piece of our, a large piece of our team. And as you can see here, a lot of different instruments being used, a lot of different talented people working together. Uh, we all 
not all, some of us went on a nice trip to Hawaii in 2019. You may recognize a couple of the faculty from the biochem department. On the left, on the top left there is Holly Putnam, my colleague at the University of Rhode Island, whom I work with a lot on these problems. And the kind of problems I'll talk about today or the kind of approaches I'll talk about are centered on methods called metabolomics. And we've done that with Xiaoyang Su, who runs the Metabolomic Center, is a professor and uh, associated with the Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey and his wonderful uh, technician, Eric Childs, standing right next to him. We work together a lot with Eric and Xiaoyang and, and in the work I'll talk about. We also work with Mehdi Javanmard, who's in electrical and computer engineering. We have some funding to develop microfluidic devices to build coral and algal and other sort of stress measurement instruments. So that's a really interesting and very, very different approach. Also work with a guy named Phil Cleves, who just started um, at the Carnegie Institute in Baltimore. He was the first one to develop reverse genetics or what's called CRISPR-Cas. I'm sure you've heard about it, the corals. So now we're actually able to knock down or knock out genes that we think may be important and see what impact they have on the coral biology. The folks in my team, Alex and Amanda are grad students and Tim and Jenna are postdocs. They've all contributed to the stuff I'll talk about. So a lot of different people, a lot of different techniques. I'm just gonna focus in on the metabolomic side because I think that's sort of the whole organism sort of idea that's really wanna hone in on today. So one of the great things about corals, of course, they live in beautiful places. And this is the beautiful place that we do a lot of our work in, the Hawaiian island chain, or the Hawaiian archipelago, which is quite amazing for a lot of reasons. It has incredible diversity of animals and plants on the island. It also has some really cool corals in the water. What makes this place particularly exciting for an evolutionary biologist like myself is that it's, uh, it's a dynamic place. There's a stationary hotspot on the bottom left of the screen that's spewing out larva, <laughs> lava and building islands. Currently the, the big island of Hawaii, which has volcanic activity as you all know, but over the years, it's actually built the rest of these islands that have been moving over the hotspot. So the, island, the oldest island is uh, Kauai, top left, and where we work, Oahu is somewhere in the middle. And so these are islands that have been created recently and they're re really, really isolated, thousands of miles from the nearest uh, high population center. So that's kind of cool. It suggests that when we see I, sort of island uh, populations, we expect them to undergo a lot of cool evolutionary processes for local adaptation, local speciation. So we're really interested in the Hawaiian corals for that reason as well, not just because it's a beautiful place to work. So, where do we work there? We work on the North Shore of Oahu at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology, HIMB, on the island of Mokulue, also known as Coconut Island. Um, it's in this bay called Kanehoa Bay. And um, it's surrounded by these beautiful reefs you can see in the water here. And the two species I'll talk about today, just to give you an idea of the kind of work we're doing. One, the species on the left, uh, top left is called rice coral or Montipora capitata. It's weedy, really stress resilient. It can actually bleach and still survive because it has the capacity to capture and live very well off bacteria and algae in the water. So corals have nidocytes that have these organs that can capture cells. So Montipora is kind of amazing. It can lose all its algae, but still stay pretty fit by feeding off uh, phytoplankton nearby. We compared it to the cauliflower coral Pasolopra acuta shown on the top right. It's much more stress sensitive. When it loses its algae through bleaching, it does a lot worse. So we kind of have two different types of models, a resilient one and a more sensitive one, but they live side by side. So they're in the same environment. They both are obviously good at what they do because they've been around for a long time, but they behave differently under thermal stress. And that's sort of what we wanted to hone in on. So here's a simple experiment we did over a few weeks. Uh, we set up these two corals at the HIMB uh, in tanks, and we just uh, cranked up the temperature about three degrees and a bunch of replicate tanks for each, and then did metabolomics and a bunch of other things that, that I'm not gonna talk about today. We looked at the microbiome, we looked at the metagenome, the metatranscriptome, lots of stuff. But today, let me just hone in on this whole organism metabolomics approach. So what is metabolomics? Well, it's pretty amazing stuff. 
Um, it's, um, it's complicated, but it's uh, very, very effective. So essentially, I, I want to restate that this is the sort of a typical metabolomics workflow that uh, Xia Yang and Eric use at the Cancer Institute that we've been using with them. Um, it's the full backpack, the, the entire holobiont. So when we take a coral nubbin, we freeze it in liquid nitrogen, use a solvent to extract the metabolites, run it through a chromatography step, run it through the mass spectrometry step, and then look at the chemicals that came out the other end. Uh, we're looking at everything, the animal's contribution, the algal symbionts contribution, any fungi if they were there, any other protists might have been there, the bacteria, the viruses. So we're looking at the full backpack of chemicals that are in that coral. We can do this because metabolites are really cool, and I'll talk a little bit about it later on, that they represent sort of the most important part of the workflow of omics. Because unlike genes and proteins, the metabolites, they're the end of the process of turning DNA into a functional um, molecule. And so they give you a direct, so they provide direct signatures of biochemical activity and are much easier to correlate with phenotype. If you have an excess of a particular type of metabolite, it probably means there's a need for that metabolite and it's a response to something. It's much more murky with genes and proteins, but the metabolites give you a really a wonderful readout. So there's some caveats, many, many metabolites in the marine world, we have no idea what they are. So we're limited to what we can study, but it certainly is a very, very interesting and exciting way forward if we want to look at how corals are responding to different stresses. So we did a lot of work in this area. And I just want to cover a couple of the high points. One of the things is you, when you look at a system for the first time, you always find cool things. So one of the most abundant metabolites we found in Montipara, the species that's very resilient, is something called monoporic acids. So these are really complicated molecules. There's four sort of uh, compounds that are related to each other shown here, A through D. And previously they had been found in eggs of Montipara digitata and in some of the tissues, but not in the amounts that we found. And what was really cool about it is that studies have shown that um, they have really strong antibacterial properties and may have anti-cancer properties. So this is a very bioactive molecule that Montipra is producing in huge amounts. So the time that we studied the Montipra was just before the mass spawning. And I'll talk about this a little bit later. This is a time when corals let egg and sperm go at once. So we think that Montipra may have been creating lots and lots of Montiporic acids to package into eggs, which would be sent out in the marine environment and be protected from bacteria, presumably, by virtue of having this monoporic acid inside of it. So we can look at, you know, in that uh, image shown here uh, on the bottom left, we can look at under control at three time points, one, three, and five, under thermal stress, one, three, and five, the production of different monoporic acids using metabolomics. And um, Amanda is really excited about this molecule. She wants to chemically synthesize it and feed it to the corals and culture and see what we can learn about the function of this really, really interesting, really kind of complicated molecule that has uh, a carbon triple bonds in it. It's really, really an uh, interesting finding in our initial metabolomics. Okay, so that was a, just an aside. So what we're looking for are molecular markers of stress. Okay, as they accumulate, just like as glucose levels accumulate in our body or other uh, compounds accumulate, they can indicate stress, disease, whatever. Can we find these sorts of chemicals in corals? And it turns out we can, and uh, we found a novel sort of group of um, chemicals called dipeptides, essentially just means two amino acids that are bound together. In this case, arginine and glutamine, or RQ. And if you look at this image on the left, this is from Antipra, the control guys, in, in uh, the corals in the control tanks are green, in the field are purple, you see some variation in the field. And T1 through T5 is the three time points we collected during prolonged thermal stress. And you can see that the accumulation of RQ follows a really nice pattern with the longer the stress, the more the marker accumulates. We found the same thing with Postulopra acuta, the more sensitive coral, again, a little bit more variation of the expression uh, in those green dots, uh, under control, but again, accumulation under stress. So this was ideal. This is a marker that if you were to go in nature and measure the RQ levels in many, many different corals, you get an idea about how the population is doing under thermal stress. 
What's also interesting about it is that people who studied this dipeptide in mice have found that it's usually associated with oxygen imbalance in cells, uh, um, in, in corneal cells or in lung cells with this oxygen imbalance, the RQ tends to be upregulated or we find more of it there. You think that this is maybe similar in corals. This response to oxygen stress is we're increasing the bleaching and the, and the algae are losing control of photosynthesis producing these things called um, reactive oxygen species or oxygen that can become um, detrimental to the health of the coral. This, this RQ might be a marker of the animals. Uh, we don't know exactly how, but it's a response that's related perhaps to this oxygen imbalance. And, and what was great is we found the same result for a bunch of other dipeptides, the lysine glutamine, arginine valine and arginine alanine. So we actually discovered a bunch of novel markers of stress that appear to accumulate under stress conditions over time. Therefore, they might be really cool ways of diagnosing the health of a coral population by measuring the levels of these dipeptides. So as I mentioned, there's an information flow in all organisms from the DNA on the left to the, to the metabolome on the right. The corals have 25 to 40, 50,000 genes. They may make about 100,000 transcripts or mRNAs, maybe a similar number of proteins, but the metabolites are about three to 4,000 probably. So can we connect the right to the left? Can we actually validate the, the metabolites that we're seeing by finding the genes that express those, um, those RNAs and, and, make, you know, and make the metabolites? Yeah, so that's... That's called multi-omics integration, where you actually make sense of the information flow from the DNA to the metabolite. It's pretty well developed for model systems, yeast, Drosophila, a few other things, which people have done a lot of genetics and biochemistry in, not so much for non-model systems like corals. Um, so they are, um, this is a, just sort of an emerging field. So somebody asked, what are the genus and species names? So they're grouped in a, um, in a family called Symbiodiniacea, and they include a bunch of different species. Their names in, include Cladocopium and Symbiodinium. Durosdinium is a whole new taxonomy that was come up with these names. And none of these corals live off the coast of New Jersey. So these are, you have to go down to Florida to get to sort of a typical coral reefs. Okay, so let's move on from there. Okay, so I'm just gonna take a little bit of information to address this integration idea that's so critical for us to validate our results, to know which genes make which metabolites, so we can build biomarkers and knowledge about all this stuff. So two things that are really worthwhile to come right to the top of the list, redox stress and mass bonding. So redox stress is, and this image comes directly from the human system. These are oxygen-based sort of radicals or, or bad versions of oxygen that can be poisonous. So Organism under stress has to make sure that it maintains redox balance by sucking off extra oxygen and getting rid of radicals of oxygen that are bad. So that's one thing. The other thing that corals, as I said, are famous for are mass spawning, where in the case of Montipra in June, July, and August, new moon, by 10 o'clock at night, they have mass spawning where eggs and sperm are released at the same time to ensure that the next generation can happen, that that fertilization between different members of the species in the populations can happen. So can we predict the spawning period? So what's been happening in the world due to warming waters is that spawning is becoming less of this small window mass spawning event to much more of a dribble dribble effect over time. And there's some evidence that warming oceans are actually weakening the, the mass spawning cycle, which could have really bad consequences for coral the future of corals. So can we develop markers for spawning that will us, help us to understand what impact you know, environmental change might be having on this really, really important feature? So there's a bunch of sort of complicated sort of ways of doing this. I'm just going to present two, uh, two of the results just to give you an idea how we're trying to integrate gene expression, that is the mRNAs made from a gene, and the metabolites that are made from the proteins that those genes encode, okay? There's a program developed by the Joint Genome Institute in California called MAGI that tries to do that. 
It takes all the gene expression data and all the metabolite data and runs it through databases and tries to figure out whether we can connect genes to metabolites. So in work that uh, uh, Amanda did in our lab, she found actually many, many animal genes that are upregulated under thermal stress use oxygen. So these are a bunch of pathways, in, in this case to make tyrosine, that use up oxygen in the cell. And it looks like the animal then upregulates these genes, and these pathways to try to maintain redox balance in the coral. So this suggests this is a major, major outcome of thermal stress. The animal does what we predicted will do. It will try to maintain redox balance. So what about mass spawning? So here is an image of, again, of spawning going on from corals when I was visiting Australia a couple of years back. So we found a bunch of the sex hormones that are associated with spawning. And so we were in Hawaii just before the spawning period. So we were then able to um, look, at, uh, uh, look at pre and post spawning. And that was really, really interesting. So here, one of the pathways that was found by Eric Childs um, had to do with uh, a bunch of different steroid hormones, in this case, progesterone. And this product of progesterone called 17 alpha hydroxyprogesterone, it shows upregulation of the gene that creates this uh, sex hormone suggesting, and this is not surprising because it's associated with oocyte maturation and spawning. So we actually have a clear evidence that in this image here, where the MS is shown, that's a mass spawning event that happened in the field. What's kind of fun and interesting to point out here is that in the control populations, there is a steady increase of this uh, hormone and the mass spawning happens. Whereas under thermal stress, it's really, really low until the mass spawning and it goes up quickly. These are early days. I just want to present to you, you know, some potential ideas. And it could well be that there is an impact on sex hormone production in its, in its regulatory cycle that might actually cause poor mass spawning events. The time we were in Hawaii in 2019 in June, it was a very, very uh, poor mass spawning event. So we hope that we can actually understand something about what spawning, how spawning will happen by looking at these sorts of markers. And we can do that by working with uh, Mehdi Javanmard and building devices that can measure metabolites uh, uh, that out in the field so we can actually get an idea about how the corals are doing. Okay, so that was sort of the more complicated take on, on sort of diagnosing coral health by generating polar metabolomic data, identifying them, counting how many molecules at different times and learning something about the pathways. Is there any easier way that we can um, diagnose coral health without going through all of that? So Amanda and Julun in uh, Mehdi's lab, they started a really cool project where they, we just postulated that, you know what, maybe some existing strips, for example, the urinalysis strips and other strips for human health might work for corals. We know that corals are animals and they share many of the same basic pathways. So they came up with this cool idea. Let's see whether that actually works. And so they would get live coral tissue, grind it up, add different buffers to it, take it down, and, and then they would then dip in it existing strips that are provide some insights into, uh, um, um, into different chemicals that can help you understand your health. Then we could take a picture of that with the red, blue, green sort of field and get an idea about how strong a reaction a particular strip had in a particular coral extract. Again, early days, but kind of promising. So here is a typical result for the leukocytes, which is a reaction I'll talk about in a second for the, for the human color strip result. And so the leukocytes are related to, uh, to the immune response and wound, and wound healing. And the corals have the same four-step response as other animals. Therefore, it's a reasonable assumption at this point. Again, we're going to validate this with really looking at the metabolites, but Kind of an interesting way to think about it that in the case of opera, when we increase the temperature, this is T1 at high temperature and three and five, what you see is that 
this reaction gets less and less. What this suggests is that there's an initial high immune response, but as this species, which is very um, prone to stress and is very sensitive to, uh, to high temperature, it actually loses that ability over time as bleaching takes on. So this species bleaches much more rapidly. So that's, that's interesting. It suggests that there's a weakening of the immune response in Pocillopra over time as the thermal stress continues. Again, this is going to have to be um, more diligently looked at, but it's really kind of promising first steps. What about the really stress sense, uh, the stress resilient rice coral? So here we look at uh, one of the many things. Uh, this is for this is this is a blood test in in a buffer called RLT. The blood test measures various compounds and proteins associated with stretch, uh, associated with stress, such as cytochrome oxidase and so on. This is a typical test for human health, for the stress levels uh, uh, in your body. What we find here is actually quite different, that Montipara, which is able to withstand stress quite well, we see increased activity with longer stress. This might suggest a robust response, that the animal is able to mount a defense to high thermal stress and is able to keep it over a longer period of time. So these are these different colors here, the dark blue, the gray, and uh, uh, they represent different genotypes. So you see here this variation. So we have to keep in mind when we look at the entire coral uh, holobiont, we're looking at different combinations of the genotype of the animal, the algae, the bacteria. So there's going to be inherent variation. And that's represented in sort of differences amongst different colonies, different genotypes, and so on. That's expected. and when we think about coral health, we don't hone in on a single genotype. We think about how the population of corals is doing and then get an idea about what the, what the values, for example, for any metabolite or for any color test like this might be. So that's kind of the start of what might be considered coral doctors. That is to, to come up with ways that are both sophisticated and maybe more direct that allow us to study coral populations in the field, but using measures that are well worked out, that are part of known pathways and mechanisms. So we're not just shooting in the dark, we're trying to get as quick as we can from a really a large unknown to a set of knowns. And that's one of the major goals in our lab um, that was presented in this uh, um, uh, in this article about a recent paper we published on coral metabolomics with all our collaborators. So there's a reason to do this beyond looking at natural reefs. Um, and, and that's obviously very important so we can know whether reefs are under high stress, they need more protection, whether some other mitigation can be done. But there's also a massive program launched by the Department of Defense uh, under the DARPA umbrella to mitigate coastal flooding, erosion, and storm damage in a program that's called ReFence, essentially is to integrate structural engineering, reef health, and adaptive biology to build artificial reefs to protect marine installations, to protect major cities and low-lying areas. So we're proposing to add this toolkit of diagnostics to such a project. So ultimately, we might be able to, in the days when a healthy and uh, resilient reef can be created artificially, we can keep track of how well it's doing over time. And that's part of our adaptive biology desire is to, we need to want to choose the most resilient coral genotypes based on these tools and then monitor their health on a reef, be it natural or one that's um, created by humans. All right, that's the end of my talk. Uh, Thanks for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Devish. That was great. Um, we do have a few questions. Uh, again, if you have questions uh, for Dr. Bhattacharya, um, just enter them into the Q&A box in the bottom of your screen. Uh, first question, um, what are the, the genus and species names of some of the algal symbionts? Are there uh, any corals that live off the coast of New Jersey? Yeah, they may, so I should say there are the, these, uh, these near shore reefs uh, don't exist in New Jersey, but they, they may well be deep water cold reefs that are, in, that are off the coast. Uh, I'm not a specialist in that area, uh, but the kind of reefs I'm talking about are, are 
tropical, semi-tropical, uh, shallow water, photosynthetic reefs. There are a lot of different corals that live in deep water that don't rely on photosynthesis. So it's, that's a much more complicated story. I, I focused uh, more or less on the, on the corals that have photosymbionts and live in warmer waters. Um, and as I said, some of the, the whole group of uh, algal symbionts are, are known in the family of dinoflagellates as symbiodiniaceae. I work with a group in Australia on doing sort of similar work on the genomics of these guys. And the more genomes we study, the more we look at the genes that they encode, uh, we find that these algae are incredibly diverse, much more than people thought. So we expect that all over the world, there's been a lot of local adaptation of algal symbionts to corals. And so this, this entire group started off with one genus named Symbiodinium. Now we know there's at least you know, five, six, seven, maybe dozens of names. And in a recent paper we just published, we found within one of the genus, the Symbiodinium genus itself, which is already now part of a bigger group, it's already broken down into more. So I think this is one of the areas of the coral biology field that needs to be looked at. And we're one of the people doing it. And we think that there's a tremendous amount of genetic diversity in these algae. And that's because it's driven by its association with particular coral species and particular environments that is sort of creating this exciting dynamic between animal and algal uh, evolution. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, what might be the reason why dipeptides are released under stress? Is this a byproduct of stress or a response to reduce stress? Yeah, that's, that's a great question, uh, Lisa. And I think the, so we, we speculated about it in the paper that just came out in Science Advances about this result. Um, our, I think our leading argument or leading thought is that when dipeptides accumulate steadily, it means that they're long lived, that, that they're not these fast turnover metabolites. So we think that this is a way in which the animal might be feeding the alga. So, so the alga is gonna be nutrient uh, starved. It's going to be lacking energy as, as photosynthesis breaks down. And the animal is trying to maintain a healthy symbiont as long as it can. So one of the ideas we have is that dipeptides are being produced in a regulated fashion, not just as a breakdown of amino acids, it's being created to feed, and there are dipeptide, there are dipeptide transporters the algae have. We think that the animal might be feeding the alga these dipeptides to try to release some of the energetic and uh, nutrient stress they may be having. But that's an idea that, that we need to test in, in more detail. Okay. Uh, what do we expect the impact of rising sea level to play on coral reefs apart from the rising temperature? Yeah, so, you know, reefs that 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 live at particular sort of light levels and and you know uh, depths in the water, they're going to suffer as as they get further underwater. And I think the um, I think the there's going to be a migration of reefs. Right? You know whether reefs can you know can grow fast enough to withstand you know sort of rising sea levels. I think it's unclear. I think that mostly we expect that they're going to be submerged and therefore they're going to become less efficient in growing in in the light environment that they were uh, evolved to do so. Uh, and the worst impacts are gonna be on the, on the low-lying lands as these reefs that break up. So the idea of creating the reef fence is actually to recreate this protection that reefs provide, the fore reef that takes the brunt of the wave uh, um, uh, energy and creates this back reef that's much more sort of calm waters and protects the, the land. Um, I think it's going to be the major impact is going to be on on low lying land, but we also expect that there, as the reefs become submerged, they're going to become much much less efficient at what they do, and that's going to wreak havoc on the biodiversity. We also don't know it's possible that as the light environment gets less, that there there's a bunch of seaweeds that are really good at using low light, and I think there's an expectation that they might start to um, take over these reefs as well. So it's it's quite a complicated problem. Okay. Uh, another question. Uh, do you think these new methods of measuring coral stress could eventually translate to conservation policy? Have there been methods used previously to create such policy? Yeah, so, so I think, so this is a very important question. And, and out of that year and a half long, excellent sort of group talk we had about the, the beauty of biology and the conservation of reefs, um, ultimately, we have to mitigate climate change. We have to stop 
that, but that is a massive problem. So I think there's a lot of local things that can be fixed. For example, coral nurseries, which are quite common uh, in Florida and in Belize and, and other places. So you can mass produce corals by fragmenting them, growing them on sort of hanging racks and you know glue them to the substrate. Many, many things are being done here. Uh, our contribution to this whole sort of issue of rebuilding reefs or reseeding reefs with chosen genotypes is really, can we choose the genotypes that are the most resilient and have the, the highest likelihood of surviving and being you know, productive members of that community? And that's where I think these stress methods are really important is that they can give us an idea about the distribution of stress metabolites. And so if an organism, a coral is able to maintain a strong defense against stress for a longer period of time, well, that's a good thing. We, we want the corals to be able to keep producing metabolites that uh, mitigate stress. And those are the, probably the ones we should be putting out in the, uh, 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 in the environment if you wanna reseed it. So I think Montipara capitata would be a good candidate for that. And as we look into this, this refence uh, project that's now being uh, put together, that's one of the things that we're supposed to do is try to identify the species and populations and genotypes and holobionts that have the capacity to withstand a strong defense against stress. Okay. Uh, one person asked if uh, we can have your email. Absolutely. The, <laughs> and we'll, we'll share that in the follow-up email. We will. Okay. Follow -up. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Brian. Yeah. Uh, another question. Uh, is there anything known about the genetic variation within your studied Montiferous species? Uh, could you do an ecotype study? Yeah, absolutely. So that's that's a great question, Mark. And uh, um, the way to do that, I at least from my genomics perspective, is we get a fantastic high quality genome. And it turned out that uh, I was lucky enough to get one of the Tree of Life grants from the company called Dovetail Genomics, and they are a um, they're a relatively new company that use a method called high C, in which they can string together large regions of DNA and bring make a chromosomal level assembly, which is actually the great thing. And that's a problem for Montipra because that genome is about 800 million base pairs or about a third of the size of the human genome. So that's being done right now. So we're gonna have soon a really high quality, you know, with almost chromosome level DNA fragments, uh, you know, uh, uh, DNA sequences of Montipra. Once we have that, we can start to look at genetic variation across the Hawaiian archipelago and see if they're associated with, with particular environments, particular stress types. So that is laying the foundation for that. But on the more broad level, the reason I was very interested in Hawaii in the first place, as I mentioned, is because it's isolated and people who studied Montipra there find very little genetic variation. It looks like they're from a founder population that's been there for a while. Uh, so most, we did a SNP analysis, which is a way of looking at DNA differences between different colonies, not a lot of SNP differences. So. We think that there's a relatively homogeneous population, but the way to really test that idea is to use this chromosome level assembly that, that we'll have uh, shortly, that we can be used and to look at any sort of ecotypic variation, adaptation and so on at the, at the DNA level. Okay, great. Uh, another question, um, how do you trace back the source of a metabolomic change? Yeah, that's, that's, that's where the, the magic of multi-omics integration comes in. So let me just give one way that we can do that, Buzz. Uh, so, so we have a genome of the animal, right? So when we make mRNA, we, we, you know, we break the coral up, we get mRNA. We can actually map those genes, those mRNAs back to the genome and say, okay, those are all made by the animal. So the stuff I showed you with the, the, the uh, progesterone and the, and the redox stress pathways, that's from the animal because we use the RNA that we could trace back or map back to the animal genome. And then we looked for metabolites that have, that are the results of those pathways and match up in terms of one goes up, the other goes up. So that's one way in which you can, by honing in on the animal uh, genes, you can actually then match up the metabolites that match the animal gene expression and have some confidence that the progesterone which we're very certain is animal derived, but also the other redox uh, pathways, the one I showed and others are from the animals. So it is a big challenge. So we could also pull out the algal genes with an algal genome and then hone in on the metabolites that go up when the algal genes go up in expression. So that's the idea. You take it apart later. You can even make bacterial genomes and start to match bacterial transcripts to metabolites. So 
that's, that's how you would try to do it. Um, the other ways to do it is something called single cell RNA-seq, which you can look at within single animal cells, uh, which has just been done for corals. You can get an idea about gene expression, so you can kind of break the whole biome down into uh, cells and tissues. Um, yeah, it's all challenging, but it can be done nowadays. Okay, great. Um, is it possible there are coral reefs in locations we haven't discovered yet? Yeah, I think the, so yeah, again, this is unfortunately not my area of expertise, but I think deep water reefs is, uh, you know, up to 100, 200 meters, I believe, underwater. There are reefs that are non-photosynthetic um, that are found in deep water uh, in, in many, many surprising places. So uh, they don't have the same biodiversity, but they do have different kind of biodiversity, microbial biodiversity and so on. But the kind of reefs that I've been talking about have mostly been mapped. And in fact, there's very, very few pristine reefs left in the world. There's uh, many coral reef watch organizations that keep track of these uh, near shore reefs that are home to fisheries and home to all this biodiversity. So um, it's possible that there are some pristine reefs around the world that haven't been uh, detected yet, but there's quite a few people who are looking for these sorts of reefs uh, for a lot of different reasons to, to learn how they work and so on. Okay, great. Uh, that was the last question that we had. Okay. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Bhattacharya, Dr. Nucci uh, for putting this all together. I really enjoyed the, the talk. Uh, as I mentioned, we're gonna send out an email to everybody um, as a follow-up. It'll include the video of this presentation along with Dr. Bhattacharya's uh, email address. I'd also like, even though this is the last uh, Virtual Science Cafe of the season, I would like to remind everybody that we are gonna have a SEBS virtual learning experience with Dr. Maria Gloria Dominguez Bello on May 20th. Uh, she's gonna talk about the microbiome and the effects of urbanization. Uh, she is also from the Department of uh, Biochemistry and Microbiology. So if you can join us for that, um, information will be coming out shortly about that as well. Uh, we'd love to have you. Um, I wish you all a good day. Uh, Mary Gavishi, do you have anything else you'd like to say? No, it was a lot of fun, thanks. Thank you so much, Debashis. Thank you, Brian. And we look forward to seeing you all next year for the 2021-2022 Science Cafe Series. So thank you for joining us today. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank Bye. you.